Good evening and welcome to the Bush Center where we have the honor of continuing the work that was started by President and Mrs. Bush when they were in the White House and taking on new work inspired by them. Core to our mission of developing leaders, advancing policy and taking action against today's most pressing challenges uh, is a call about leadership. And it's something that is near and dear to the heart of the presidents that we'll hear today. We execute our mission through our impact centers focused on domestic excellence, global leadership, and engaging the public. And this program today is a double header because we get to showcase one of our outstanding programs where we can develop and recognize great leadership and bring that work to the community. Obviously, these are the kinds of programs that are unique to presidential centers. And getting four of them together in a wonderful program uh, is what this country is all about. That great example uh, starts with, and I have to thank President Bush, President Clinton, and Mrs. Bush for your leadership and your willingness to devote your time to this group today. Thank you very much for being here. And of course, this world-class programming would not be possible without the support of donors and friends in the room. Um, thank you all for investing in this important work and thank you for your attendance today. I'd also like to thank and specially recognize uh, our board members here in the audience, Mark Langdale, Gene Phillips, Don Evans, Bill Hickey, and Gerald Turner, and also thank our friends here at SMU uh, who are wonderful partners in our work um, in addition uh, to being uh, wonderful landlords. Uh, and then also joining us today is uh, Pat Mordente, a retired general from the U.S. Air Force who has taken over the responsibilities as director of the library and museum uh, across the courtyard. Very important part of this institution, and thank you, Pat, for your leadership. And my job is really quite easy because I get to introduce my right hand, the woman who makes uh, my job very, very easy, the executive director of the Bush Institute, Holly Kuzmich. Thank you, Ken, and thank you all for joining us today for the graduation of our Presidential Leadership Scholars. This program is a partnership of the three presidential centers in Texas, our center here, the George W. Bush Presidential Center, the George Bush Presidential Library Foundation in College Station, and the LBJ Foundation in Austin, and our neighboring presidential foundation in Arkansas, the Clinton Foundation. And today, we're here to celebrate the 60 graduates of this program. But before we begin, I want to acknowledge our friends and supporters with us today. First, the partners at those three other presidential centers, Bruce Lindsay, Stephanie Street, Mike Hemphill from the Clinton Foundation, Amy Barbie, Larry Temple, and Mark Updegro from the LBJ Foundation, and David Jones from the George Bush Presidential Library Foundation. Thank you all for being here. Members of our Presidential Leadership Scholars Advisory Committee, Secretary Carlos Gutierrez, who serves as our chair this year, and Ambassador Lyndon Olson, and last but not least, we're joined by many of the generous sponsors of this program. Without their support, this program would not be possible. And they include the Moody Foundation, the Carruth Foundation, the Miles Foundation, the Harold W. McGraw Jr. Family Foundation, Bank of America, and David Rubenstein, who we are pleased has joined us today and who you'll hear from later. We are so grateful for your support of this program. None of it would be possible without you. The idea for this program came about in late 2013 when we began discussing the idea of a leadership experience that would build on the assets and resources of these four presidential centers and explore the consequential periods of time when these four presidents served in office. This year, the class, or the scholars as we call them, have interacted with senior administration alumni across the four presidential administrations on leadership lessons and insights, often using case studies to highlight those lessons. They've heard from people like Andy Card, Mac McClarty, Dana Perino, Robert Gates, and Bill Moyers. They've had in-depth conversations with Presidents Bush and President Clinton. They were visited in the classroom by President and Mrs. George H.W. Bush, and they heard tapes of LBJ's consequential conversations with civil rights leaders and members of Congress about the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And they got to hear from Lucy Baines Johnson as well. They've worked on their own leadership skills and they've put that into practice through their personal leadership projects. The goal we outlined when we started PLS was to develop and hone the leadership skills of highly motivated people from across all sectors and backgrounds, business, nonprofit, government, military, 
media, academia, in order for them to make a significant contribution in their communities. And we think we've succeeded. This year's class, as well as the two previous classes, are proving that. We're proud to recognize them today. And we're also already recruiting for our next class for 2018. Applications are currently open through August 31st at presidentialleadershipscholars.org. From the beginning, this program would not have succeeded without the close collaboration and shared vision among our friends across the four presidential centers. And so now I'm pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Stephanie Street, the executive director of the Clinton Foundation. Thank you so much, Holly. On behalf of my colleagues at the Clinton Presidential Center and Foundation who are here today, I would like to say what a great pleasure it is to be with you. This, uh, this Presidential Scholars Program has really exceeded, I think, all of our initial expectations. And we are so proud of what this program has become. We are in constant awe of the accomplishments of our scholars and really excited to see the impact they will have on their communities in the years to come. While some of the success of PLS can be credited to the individual abilities of each of our scholars, we also realize that the true value of our program comes from assembling an amazing array of perspectives, life experiences, talents, and mastery into one cohesive group. We've always believed that PLS brings together individuals who otherwise would never cross paths with one another. Individuals who at first glance wouldn't appear to have much in common, but soon realize that they have more in common than they could have ever imagined. It's sort of the way we feel about our friends here at the Bush Center. We started this journey with them three years ago. And at first glance, I think a lot of people wondered how it would be for us to work together. Well, I'll tell you how it is. It's fabulous. It's been a joy to work with the Bush Center team because we share a passion for this program, for its mission to promote stronger and more collaborative leadership across our country, and for what our scholars can learn by studying how our four presidents approached some of our country's toughest challenges. I want to say a special word of thanks to Ken Hirsch, Holly Kuzmich, Kristen King, Catherine Janes, Katie Lynham and all of the incredible staff here at the Bush Center for taking this journey with us. Would you please give them all a hand? It has become our tradition to have one of the graduating class of scholars introduce our guest speakers. This year, that honor falls to Dr. Srayram Coy. When Dr. Coy joined the program, she was serving as the Chief Medical Officer for Medicaid for the state of Louisiana, where she has led the fight against that state's opioid epidemic. Among her many accomplishments in that position, Dr. Coy helped create and implement an naloxone standing order to empower people to intervene during overdoses, create limits on Medicaid payments for prescription opioids, and help define legislative limits on opioid prescriptions. She also helped deliver, uh, develop a website to assist patients and doctors who are dealing with this crisis on the front lines. In her new position, she will be serving our nation's veterans, working to improve quality health care, patient safety, and value-based care. So on the enthusiastic recommendation of her fellow scholars, would you please welcome to the stage Dr. Srayram Coy. Good evening, I'm Swaram Khoi, and I am so grateful for the privilege of getting to be a part of the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. This has been such an incredible, life-changing experience that's brought together people from across the country from all sorts of different disciplines. We have a teacher, a social worker, a doctor, an army veteran, a judge, a marine, a social activist, a councilman, as I look around at my class, I see a diversity of different beliefs, 
I see a Democrat, a Republican, a liberal, a conservative, and independent. I see Catholic, Protestant, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh. But at the heart of it, what I see are Americans coming together with a deep, deep commitment to social and civic engagement. Americans willing to listen and to discuss challenges and to learn from each other despite and because of our differences. We may come from different fields and different backgrounds, but we come together for a common purpose, to serve our country through public service. This is the heart of the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. I'm reminded by what President Bill Clinton taught our class. He said, I believe we are all equal and everyone deserves a chance. In another session, President George Bush taught us, it's amazing what life will yield when you take a little risk. To me, these are the values that are the cornerstone of what makes America so amazing. And these are the values that are so real to me because it wasn't always my reality. I was born in Cambodia during a genocide now known as the Killing Fields. And during that regime, people were executed for the crime of being educated. Because being educated meant you had the knowledge and the ability to think differently and to discuss those differences. Taking the risk to show compassion or to help someone else was punishable by torture or death. Public service was replaced by brutality. I was born in a country where doctors were shot. But today, in America, I have the freedom to work as a surgeon caring for our nation's veterans. So I am overwhelmed that I can say I've had the opportunity to learn from the presidents of our country, from their cabinet members, from their advisors, and gain insights about leadership. Only in America is this a possibility. I'm the daughter of a janitor. I'm a refugee. I'm a child survivor of war and genocide. That's why I am so grateful and so proud to live in this country where we are all equal and where everyone truly deserves a chance. And given that chance, we can take the risk and see what life will yield. And I know that every single one of my classmates here have taken President Clinton and President Bush's teachings to heart. They are taking that risk and working every single day to make our communities better and ensuring that everyone has a chance. Inspired by our professors, President Clinton and President Bush, my classmates are working to serve our country through novel, exciting public service projects that are enabled by the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. Liz is working to help children in the foster care program. Chike is creating social and economic opportunity through internet connectivity. Martha is helping incarcerated women break the poverty cycle. David is inspiring military families to connect with their children through reading. Carlos is using skateboarding to unite communities. Wade is advocating for voter rights. Francisco is increasing access to education for Pakistani women. Neha is bringing clean energy to rural African communities. And Danny is tackling head on police community relations and racial divides. All of this is possible only because President Bush and President Clinton collaborated across their differences, across their political beliefs to create an experience that produces bold and principled leaders needed to help our nation's most pressing challenges. It is truly amazing what life will yield when you take that risk and work together to ensure that everyone has a chance. We are truly better off when we work together. In a moment, we'll have the opportunity to hear from President Clinton and President Bush hosting a dialogue about presidential leadership. The presidents will be joined by David Rubenstein, co-founder and co-CEO of the Carlisle Group. Mr. Rubenstein is a supporter of the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program and our country's strongest historical philanthropist. 
Mr. Rubenstein is the host of the David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversation, and this conversation will air on his show in the coming months. And Mr. Rubenstein actually visited our class in DC during our very first session. And while there, he taught our class, philanthropy means loving humanity. It is this love of humanity that fuels our passion to make our communities better, to take those risks, and to work to ensure that everyone gets a chance. So thank you, President Clinton and President Bush, for creating this opportunity for Americans across the country to come together for the common purpose of serving our country through public service. Thank you. time, it is my honor to introduce to you this afternoon the 42nd and 43rd Presidents of the United States, President William J. Clinton and President George W. Bush. strong. Tough to follow that act, okay? So I'd like to start by acknowledging the presence of uh, Mrs. Bush. Thank you very much for being here. Ashley, I was supposed to do that. Okay, sorry. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you about your, your parents. How are they doing? I hate these tough questions. Uh, uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I told Dad today that I was going to be on stage with Bill, and uh, you were the moderator. What did he say? Uh, it, well, he was surprised. <laughs> okay. Okay. You couldn't, you're surprised you couldn't do anybody better. Get yeah, anybody better. <laughs> yeah, Oprah uh, doing, wasn't available. They're doing well. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really fortunate to be the only president with both parents alive after the presidency. And uh, so every day is a blessing. Okay. to have your mom and dad alive, and they're doing well, 93 and 92 years old. And uh, uh, thank you for asking. I'll tell him you asked. <laughs> okay. How is Hillary doing? Good. We, uh, if you knew our grandkids, you'd know she's good. I mean, she did really well. She's been working on a book, and we spent every available hour with our grandchildren. And my grandson just turned a year old on Father's Day. Wow which means every seven years, his father will celebrate Father's Day on his son's birthday, which is kind of a nice thing. And my almost three-year-old granddaughter sang happy birthday to him at his party. Can your uh, granddaughter sing happy birthday in Mandarin? <laughs> no, but she can't Mine sing can. it in Spanish. <laughs> so, um, well, what, do, what are your, well, you both have grandchildren. What do your grandchildren call you? What are you called? I'm called Jefe. Right? What, what do your grandchildren call you? I'm more humble. I'm called Pop Pop. <laughs> All right. None of them call you he, Mr. You President. Look, you're the one that told me that once you become a grandparent, you're immediately at the bottom of the family totem pole. You're the least important person in the family. It's true. So uh, we qualify. So uh, let's think, talk about this. Uh, we'll talk about your presidencies, but you're now both former presidents. and. Uh, uh, what's the difference between being a former president and president? Now, one day you have the nuclear codes. You can send nuclear bombs off. You, everybody is working for you. And the next day, when you leave office, you have no power. What was the transition like? Nobody plays a song when you walk in the room anymore. <laughs> I mean, I was lost for the first three weeks after I left office. I kept waiting for the music, you know. Uh, Actually, uh, it's wonderful. There, I've had almost not a, very rarely in 17 years have I been given a thought to, uh, well, I wish I were there, I could do this, or I missed this. Or, I think, you know, you, you have to be grateful for the time you have, 
and then realize you should focus on today and the future. And I think it's, a, it's, it's both liberating and also uh, it concentrates the memory. You don't know how many years you got left, but you feel that you, the country's given you something priceless and you owe something back. And so each in our own way, we've tried to figure that out. And I found it a really rewarding part of my life. I've loved it. Well, I, uh, so I woke up in Crawford uh, <laughs> and, uh, the day after the presidency expecting someone to bring me the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Laura didn't bring the coffee. <laughs> Uh, I think the thing that startled me was uh, the sense of having no responsibility. In other words, during the presidency, you kind of become accustomed to the responsibility you have. First, it's pretty grave, and then slowly but surely, it becomes uh, a natural part of your life. And then you wake up the next day, and you have no responsibility. And that was probably the most stunning thing for me. But when you're both president, when you try to do something, you have somebody on the opposite political party, typically, who says it's a terrible idea. And so it's hard to get things done in Washington, maybe harder than it's ever been now, but hard when you were there as well. When you're a former president, do you find it's easier to get things done? Yes, yeah, depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah, I think it depends. First of all, you have to realize what you don't have and what you do. Uh, it was, it, it's really true that I, I loved the job, and I loved all the responsibility. But it's amazing how much of every day is taken up by things you have to do as president and by the incoming fire. And, you know, when he was, for example, running, I watched all of his debates with Al Gore very carefully, and nobody said, what are you guys going to do if uh, al-Qaeda blows up the World Trade Center? Right. And uh, you see this in a lot of different ways. And... Uh, if you don't deal with the incoming fire, it will undermine your ability to do anything else. If all you deal with is the incoming fire, you can't keep the promises you made when you were running. So it's a lot of trouble. Now, when you get out, you switch, you change all that power, but that clutter for whatever influence you have and whatever your experience and contacts will permit you to do. And you have to decide what to do. And everybody makes different decisions. So, President Carter, I think we should all be thinking about it. He collapsed today, Wally, but he's fine. He was building habitat houses in Canada. That's what he decided he wanted to do. And by doing it, he helped habitat to grow into one of the biggest home building operations in the world. So we all had to make these decisions. Well, former presidents. I don't think it's that easy, uh, frankly, to get things done necessarily. I mean, for example, one of the great accomplishments in my post-presidency was the building of this building and, and, and the installation of programs that we think makes it make a difference. But it was hard work to get there. Uh, in other words, there's not a, 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 an appropriations well, bill. Well, it's not easy. Um, <laughs> so but today, when former presidents get together, uh, which happens in funerals, unfortunately, and also sometimes in libraries open, it's not common that you get together. When, what is it like in the back room? What do you actually say to each other when your former presidents are getting together? Do you actually tell secrets that you never tell anybody else? Or? <laughs> yeah. Generally, we say, when's this program going to start and when's it going to end? <laughs> <laughs> and he'll say to me, give shorter answers. <laughs> I think you know, it's unusual with us because we had, um, because when I was, when I left office, I told them, I said, you know, if I can ever help you, and I will do it. If I can't in good conscience, I won't, but I'll never embarrass you in public. And, you know, Hillary was a senator. I said, I may have to make some comment that disagrees with some policy or not, but I will always do it respectfully. And I want you to succeed. And I tried to be as good as my word. And then he gave me one of the great gifts of my life, the chance to work with his father uh, after the tsunami in South Asia and then after Katrina. And we had a heck of a time doing it. We did a lot of good. And that brought us all, all three of us closer. Well, I'll think. talk about that for a moment. Uh, you ran against uh, President Bush 41. 
It was a bitter campaign. He was defeated for re-election. How did you manage later to develop a close relationship? Wasn't that very difficult or awkward at times because you had run against each other? He had called you names, you had called him names. How did you come together? I think it helped that we had some contact before. You know, I, I, was rep I represented the Democratic governors when he decided to embrace these national education goals and he asked the governors to help write them. And we started working together. And then I, I, I tried never to take a cheap shot as in the Governors Association. If we disagreed, we said it, went on, we found things we could do together. And I think the other thing is, like I said, he deserves a lot of credit because if he hadn't asked us to do this tsunami work together, I'm not sure the relationship would have ever flowered the way it did. And we just like being together. And, you know, you just, it's like anything else. Sometimes you click with people and sometimes you don't. I always admired him. I think I completely supported what he did in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, supporting German reunification, supporting the European Union, supporting the efforts he made and I made uh, with, as you see today, mixed results to try to integrate Russia into the family of democracies and everything. And so we just started working together on the, this tsunami thing was, it's easy to forget now because it was a long time ago, but I mean, they lost uh, 300,000 people in right. a matter of minutes in several countries. And, and then President Bush said, America's got to do our part. Most people couldn't find a lot of those little countries on the map, but they were part of the global community that he was willing to take our fair share of responsibility for. But that was your relationship with President Bush 41, but how did you become close because you- Well, I got a different take on uh, what okay. I think is one of the most- All right. One of the most unique relationships and an important relationship in U.S. political history. Uh, I think it starts with Bill Clinton being a person who refused to lord his victory over dad. In other words, he was humble in victory, which is very important in dealing with other people. Uh, and uh, and I think dad uh, was willing to rise above the political contest. In other words, it starts with the individual's character. And both men, in my judgment, displayed uh, strong uh, character. And therefore, the friendship was able to be formed. Right. Now, why do I have a friendship with him? Well, well because he's called... Uh, a brother with a different mother. He, he hangs out in our... Because when you campaign... He hangs out in Maine more than I do. <laughs> right. Well, when you campaigned, you were campaigning against some of the things that the Clinton administration had done, I assume, when you were running in 2000. Yeah, probably. I don't know that... I, go ahead. Well, we're both baby boomers, we're, uh, and we're both Southern governors. We had a lot in common. Uh, he got along with people in his legislature. I got along with mine. We had friends in common. And so there was a, kind of a natural, uh, there was a, a natural ability to, to respect and like each other. Right. I, and, I, so I, therefore, I, if you disagree with someone, it doesn't mean you don't, dis you, you don't like him. Right. Also, you know, I recognized that he was 44 days older than me. Okay. <laughs> so for 44 days, we're in the middle of this 44-day period, by the way. So I called him on his birthday and I said, I'm calling you on bended knee because this begins my 44 days of respect for my elders. <laughs> uh, when I was oh. president, I would call Bill and, uh, you know, he was very helpful. And it, it wasn't, you know, it was, uh, he, he knew a lot about a variety of issues, particularly international affairs that I was interested in. I knew I could uh, count on him for good advice and, uh, and uh, he was gracious in receiving my calls. President Clinton, uh, you've done something that was very unique. In, in all of us who have gone to school recognize that sometimes there's somebody who's the student body president, is the class president, and everybody thinks this person could be president of the United States, but none of them actually have made it except you. You were the only person really in the 20th century who was a student leader from the beginning and actually made it to president of the United States. So what was the factor that drove you to keep you know, being such a leader from a, from a high school to college to graduate school, because most people burn out and they say, I don't want to still be a leader. And you managed to pull this off. What were you think the qualities were that instilled by your mother or, or well, what? I also lost two elections along the way, which kind of keeps you humble. First of all, I think all that stuff's kind of way overrated. I, I think I got elected because I was the 
basically we were the last generation that was born without a television. I was 10 years old before we got a television. I grew up in a conversational culture where people actually talked and listened to each other. And it, I, I don't know how these people make it today. I mean, you got the average president talks eight seconds on television, Snapchat's 10 seconds, Twitter's 140 characters. I mean, you know, we, uh, my life revolved around meals and I had, and my father died, you know, in a car wreck before I was born. So I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and their generation and my great uncle was the smartest guy in our family and he presided over conversations and he involved the kids in them. And he taught me that everybody's got a story and most people can't tell it and that's sad. And that people are intelli inherently interesting if they can get out of their own way. So I was taught to listen and to look and I really think that's what it is. I just cared about, I always thought I'd have a better life if I could have somebody else have a better life too. And I liked it. I just got, and I got lucky. I don't care what anybody says. All these people that tell you they were bald, born in a log cabin they built themselves were full of bull. So now I often think that I was partially responsible for your being elected president because um, I worked in the White House for President Carter. And you may remember towards the end of your first term as governor, we put a lot of Mario boat people in Arkansas, which made it impossible for you to get reelected. And I thought that by not being reelected, you were driven so much harder to work to be president later on. So yeah, I really appreciate it. I don't think I ever adequately thank you for doing that. Okay. <laughs> so at the time, you weren't that happy about it. But uh, <laughs> now, President Bush, um, I think I'm responsible for your being elected this way. Uh, I worked in the Carter White House. I got inflation to 19 percent. That enabled. President Reagan to get elected and your father to be vice president and ultimately probably help maybe you become president. You ever thought about that? I think uh, Clinton had a bigger role to play in it than you did because okay. I don't think I ever would have run for governor had he not defeated dad in 1992. Really? Yeah. It had been uh, very difficult for me to have beaten Ann Richards in 1994 because I'd have spent my time defending uh, George H.W. Bush who had been in the last two years of his presidency. Oh. And by losing... Uh, it, it enabled Brother Jeb and me to, to be able to kind of run on our own for governor in our respective well, states. Both of you ran for Congress the first time you ran, and you both lost. Um, so you have that in common, but after you lost the first time, you were trying to beat uh, an incumbent congressman, and you lost. Uh, did you say, I'm out of politics, or what made you say, I'm going to go? No, well, uh, I got a break in a way. I, I, I think about one that in the House, you know, the Democrats did really well in 1974 in the House races because it was after... President Nixon resigned. But I ran against a congressman who was one of his father's John best Paul? friends. You ran against John Paul? Yeah, John. Yeah. He had an 85% approval rating and 99% name recognition. That's called suicide. Right. And I was, <laughs> I was zero, zero, and he beat me 51 to 48, three, by three points. And it's the best thing that ever happened to me. We wound up being friends too. But this district we ran in had the highest amount of gasoline used for registered vehicle in America because it was so rural and all on hilly roads and you had to do stuff people don't do anymore. Your television ads didn't amount to anything if you didn't do retail campaigning. And I learned 75% of what I know about politics in that first race. Now, were you, it was at that time, uh, Hillary Clinton, Hillary Rodham then came down and was helping you in that campaign. Did, did uh, you really think that at that time that uh, she was going to stay down in Arkansas and marry you because, you know, Arkansas was not considered in her world uh, the place that was the center of the, the universe, exactly? I did not know. I had, I, I, look, I, did, I had wound up having it uh, one step at a time. I'd already asked her twice to marry me, and she'd said no both times. Smart girl. Right. <laughs> so the third time, I said, well, just come down here. And they liked her so much at the law school, they offered her a job teaching. And so she didn't have anything else to do. Her other job was uh, she was working with the House Judiciary Committee. So when that whole thing was over, she just took the job and it worked out pretty well. Well, when you uh, got married, you said to your wife or she said to you, I don't want to ever make any speeches. And you kind of implied you weren't going to get into politics. And then no, no, not true. OK. <laughs> uh, I, we got married uh, in November. And the next year, I campaigned for Congress. 
Okay. But I said she'd never have to give a political speech. And, and then she did. <laughs> and she was pretty good at it, I Damn guess. good speaker, yeah. So when you lost for your house, you ran the house seat. Yeah, nine, and you lost. Seventy-eight. Sure did, did you say, I'm out of politics? And For a while, uh, but it turns out, like Bill said, it's the best thing that happened to me. As Ken Hans, the guy that beat me, said, if I hadn't beat Bush, he'd still be on the Agricultural Committee. <laughs> well, when you, you decided to run for uh, governor against an incumbent, Ann Richards, your mother and father said you have no chance of winning. The father didn't say that, the mother did. And, and what did you say to her when you won? Uh, I, I said, well, are you going to come to the inauguration? <laughs> uh, no, I, you look, you know my mother. You never you know, you like pop off to her like that, otherwise. Uh, uh, yes. so, She'll floor you. <laughs> so when, um, when both of you became president, now your father had been president. You had not uh, had a father been president, but you've been around government. What was the biggest surprise? When you, the first day you're in the Oval Office, you learn the secrets, the nuclear codes, you learn all the, the crises that we might be getting into. What was the biggest surprise that you found, and when did it hit you that you're President of the United States, all the power, you're the most powerful man in the world? When did it first hit you? The first day, the first week, the first month? Well, you know, Harry Truman said that being, the most amazing thing about being President is you spend so much of your time trying to talk people into doing things they should do without your asking them in the first place. But what surprised me and maybe because I was, and one of his dad's best gigs on me is I was the governor of a small southern state. That was factually true. And um, was that you're so far removed from the American people that it's hard for them to see you as a three-dimensional person. And I had to learn all over, even when he's governor of Texas, as big as Texas is, I think you had a much more personal relationship with the people, like Bob Bullock, who's a lieutenant governor, was a Democrat, a very good friend of mine. He loved George Bush, and, and I think he helped him be a better governor. So, you know, we were just used to being people and dealing with people, and I, it really surprised me how easily I could be turned into a two-dimensional cartoon instead of a three-dimensional human being. And you have to discipline yourself about what to talk about, how to talk about it, and you have to keep remembering there's all these layers between you and people that didn't used to be there, and that surprised me. I, I thought I was a pretty good communicator. I thought I could, you know, and I just fell on my face four or five times till I figured out how to do it. You became president at a very young age. You were 46 years old. So if you had been president at 56 or 66, do you think it would have been different, or you would have less energy at that age, or would more experience? How would you... I think, uh, I think I would have been better in some ways if I'd been older. And, but I think I would have been not as good in some ways, because sometimes you get a bunch done because you're too dumb to know you can't do it. Okay. You show up and you keep trying to do it and something happens, you know. You so, now, well, you, your father was president, so you obviously was, were in the White House. You saw what he did right or what he might have done wrong. Did you take any lessons from that, or were you trying to separate yourself from your father? No, I learned a lot from watching him. And, uh, uh, and he, he, I wasn't interested in separation from him, and he wasn't, he wasn't interested either. We've got a, a great father-son relationship. And, uh, uh, yeah, I learned a lot from watching him. And my most startling moment came uh, right after the inaugural parade. I decided I was going to go in the Oval Office to see what it felt like. And uh, unbeknownst to me, Andy Card had called upstairs in the residency and asked Dad to come in. And so I was sitting in the uh, Oval Office at the desk there, kind of just taking it all in. And in walks my dad. And I said, oh, welcome, Mr. President. He said, thank you, Mr. President. Wow, that must been something. What was it like when your mother walked in the Oval Office the first time and you're the President of the United States? <laughs> she, she started laughing out loud. <laughs> I mean, it was so ridiculous, you know, I mean, the idea of it, that it could have ever happened. And, uh, but on the other hand, when I started running, she was the only person who thought I had a good chance to win. Nobody else did. Hillary and Chelsea were undecided at the beginning. Right. So, but it made me feel good because, you know, my mother had a pretty tough life. She was widowed three times, and um, she had a pretty tough life, and she got up at 
five o'clock every morning and got herself ready and was at work by seven and then did everything she could to take care of me. And so I was proud to be able to show it to her. And she was ill then, but she lived another year, uh, just a little more than another year about the time. And, uh, or excuse me, a little less than another year. She died the next June the 6th. I mean, January the 6th. So what's it like to live in the White House? You want to know what my mother said? Well, I, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can imagine. Get your feet off the Jeffersonian table. <laughs> <laughs> um, but your mother was proud, of course. I mean, think about this. Yeah, she She's was. the only, there's only one woman who ever had uh, a son become president of the United States who father had also been president of the United States, Abigail Adams, but I don't think she was alive when John Quincy Adams became president. So your mother was the only person who saw her husband be president and her son. Pretty unusual. Yeah, it is. So today, um, when you were living in the White House, is it, some people call it a, a kind of a prison because you really can't get out very much, or do you really enjoy it? And it's just a great thing you got all these servants there and you go to Camp David when you want. Is it a pleasure to live there or not so much? I think if you've been... If you've lived an informal life, even in though I spent, you know, almost a dozen years in the governor's mansion in Arkansas, it's very different. I mean, if you've lived uh, and, you know, if you've been like I basically was self-supporting from the time I was 19 and uh, it was, I it took some getting used to, but I developed a real respect and affection for the people that work there and they, uh, I I developed an enormous amount of respect for the Secret Service and the risks they take. And I adjusted myself accordingly. And uh, I, I love living in the White House. I remember very vividly the last time I got off of the helicopter Marine One and walked into the White House as president before I would soon be gone and he would be there. And I, I was consciously aware that I was going in there more optimistic than I was. Wow. about America than the first time I walked in. More idealistic. I just, I never got tired of it. And did you like living in the White yeah, House? Yeah, I did. It's great. It's really, uh, oh. they pamper you. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, we knew a lot of the staff. They were the same people that worked there when Bill was there and many of the same when Dad was there. So we had gotten to know him when, uh, Laura and I got to know him when we went to visit. Uh, but it's, it's great. It's really, really a uh, historic place. It is, um, it is uh, comfortable. Uh, I loved every minute of living there. So what about Camp David? Most people have never been to Camp David. Uh, so tell us, what's it like at Camp David? Is it a great place to re have a retreat and relax, or is it really overrated? No, I liked it. I mean, it's a great place, particularly if you, for, I, I loved it most at Thanksgiving, because I'd bring all our family in, you know, and I liked it when Chelsea could bring her friends up there. And you, you have a little more at least you're under the illusion that you have while you're on the ground, more freedom of movement, more wandering around time. Just, it's great just to get away. You like yeah, it? I went there a lot, and or we went there a lot, and uh, probably used it more than any president. Maybe Ronald Reagan did more, but the reason we went a lot is one, we could invite our friends. One of the great delights of the presidency was to invite friends we grew up with in Midland, for example, and uh, show them the Right. Oval Office or Sean Camp David. But the other thing I liked about it a lot is that I'm, I, I love exercise. And the place is set up for a lot of hiking, running, mountain biking. There's a wonderful yeah. gym there. And it's a, it's a liber I found it to be liberating. Now, mountain biking is a dangerous thing, and you've fallen a couple times, maybe. Yeah, it's true. And, but you haven't given it up, or you're... No, I still ride it. Okay, you don't worry about breaking things? No. Okay. And... Remember the wrist thing she was talking about? Right. The, so your form of exercise... dad's jumping out of planes, planes. at 85 or 90. And your exercise you is, you, you play golf, but you obviously have lost weight since you left the presidency. You've gone on a vegan diet. How did, how, isn't that hard to do? And Less burgers. <laughs> how did you Not do that? Not when you have quadruple heart bypass and you want to live to be a grandfather. I didn't give it a second thought. I said, you know, I realized that I was highly prone to arterial blockage and I thought I'd cut my chances. I literally wanted to see if I could live to be a grandfather. I, unlike him who comes from great genes, I am now the oldest person in my family for three generations, man or woman. Wow. And so I thought it was, I said, you know, I think I'd like to hang around. I'm kind of having a good time being alive. And I, 
it, it'll so, be over soon, soon enough, and I think I'll just stretch it out as long as I can. So if you um, could run for President of the United States or former President of the United States, what would you recommend? What's a better job, to be President of the United States for eight years? Um, and you two were the, there are only 13 people in our country's history who served two consecutive terms. And you're two of the 13, so if you could serve th two consecutive terms, would you rather do that or be a former president for 30 or 40 years? What do you think is more enjoyable? Well, first of all, I think it depends on what, how you keep score. But I think you've got to be former, you've got to live a long time as a former president to have the impact on as many people as you can as president. And I've tried to do as best I could on that, but if you gave me the choice, I'd serve as two terms. Yeah, me too. Yep. And the reason why is the decisions you make have got a uh, uh, monumental effect on a lot of people. And it's, uh, uh, it was, it's, it's exciting to be in that kind of environment. It, uh, it, it taps, it, it, it insists that you use all your skills and your energy in order to affect policy in a positive way. The interesting thing about the presidency is it's often defined by the unexpected, and uh, which makes the job doubly interesting. It's very interesting, though. A lot of our most successful former presidents serve one term. John Quincy Adams, you know, went back to right. Congress for 16 years and one of, one of our most important anti-slavery advocates. Uh, William Howard Taft became Chief Justice. Herbert Hoover came out of retirement and wrote the Civil Service Act. Right. Uh, they, they did a lot of good things. And I feel that, you know, George and I have been blessed because we were reasonably young and uh, Barack Obama's young. And so you got you get can be double lucky. You can serve eight years as president and then do some other good things. So um, I assume you would recommend the job to people if they wanted to be president of the United States. Um, John Kennedy was once asked at a press conference, uh, "What do you think about this job? And would you recommend it, job?" And he said, "Well, not to others right now, I guess, because I'd wait till I'm finished my tenure. But would you recommend the job to people, the young young people, young leaders, presidential scholars?" If they want to be president of the United States, would you say it's worth the aggravation factor and all the hard work to become president, or would you recommend they pursue something else? Oh, yeah, something in a else? heartbeat. I, uh, Same. You would? Yeah. Not There's a good chance we're looking at a future president if amongst the 60 graduates here. Right. <laughs> so you would recommend it. The, the highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity, but you would say that <laughs> being president of the United States is better than private equity, right? I don't know. So we, we make two hundred thousand a year in pension. What do you make? Uh, well, I, money I, isn't everything, but yes. Look, I, <laughs> if we could just say one serious thing, I mean, I think there are a lot of really big questions floating around right there. Uh, Carlos Slim, the Mexican multi-billionaire, is a really smart guy. Gave a speech during the campaign. And the campaign being what it was, obviously nobody was interested in asking about it, but he said, I believe that this will be the first technological revolution that will kill more jobs than it creates. And therefore, I believe we will either have to have people with money pay even higher taxes to just subsidize people living who don't, or the richest countries are going to have to start planning first for a four-day and ultimately for a three-day work week because of automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Now, no one knows the answer to that. Nobody knows if he's right or not. But that means that it's not going to be boring. It's not boring figuring out how to make deal with all these climate change issues to do it in time uh, and do it in a way that helps the economy, not hurts it. It's not boring figuring out whether we can have a more broadly shared prosperity and still have growth. I mean, these are very significant questions, and it's also not boring figuring out how to navigate a political world in which the nation state's borders are porous, not just in terms of vulnerability to terrorist attacks, but cyber terrorism and all this. This is gonna be, it's a, it's a fascinating, sobering, but exhilarating time to be alive, and also, I told George once a year ago, I said, I, I hope you're not the first Republican, not the last Republican president who's not afraid of immigrants. Right. I mean, in other words, we agree with it. We, I, we could go to South Texas and have a 
discussion about what immigration reform should look like, but if you, if you look at America, we're only having a 2.1 uh, replacement of our native-born population from natural births. We can't continue to grow this economy unless we grow more diverse and take in more immigrants, so we got to be comfortable about it. I mean, aren't you glad that a Cambodian woman found her way to Louisiana to help people <laughs> over so, so as you, um, as you yeah, look, I got, my only regret is she didn't find her way to Texas. Okay. <laughs> so as you look, both of you, you look back on your presidency, you both served 18, eight, uh, eight years. And as I was trying to say earlier, our country's had roughly 550 million people in our country's history have been Americans, 550 million Americans uh, over the course of our history. 45 of them elected president, but only 13 people have served two consecutive terms. And you were two of the three, uh, two of 13. So um, what would you say in your eight years you were most proud of having it done? I was m most proud that when I left office, we had the broadest period of shared prosperity in 50 years. That is, where the bottom 20%'s income in percentage terms increased more than the top 20% and nobody was mad at anybody else over it. It was shared across racial and religious and regional lines. Did I abolish inequality? No. And you can't in a market society. But at least we found a way to have more shared prosperity and including three budget surpluses. But I was, I, I wanted, because I think if everybody's got a decent job and something to look forward to in the morning, about 90% of the other problems go away. So. Whatever argument we might have, let's say, about uh, health care policy or any other social policy, it will all become less significant if people think they can start a business and keep a job and educate their kids. Then families are stable, communities are more stable, and all the other problems get smaller. What would you say in your eight years? You Well, it, my, my daughters love me. Right? <laughs> uh, it, it, as Bill will tell you, it's a challenge to have teenage daughters uh, when you're the president, and uh, it's a challenge any time to have teenage daughters. <laughs> and uh, uh, thanks to Laura's guidance and love, our little girls, uh, our family unit strengthened. And I think that's a great accomplishment. Right. Me and, too. And, and, you know what I think? This is what I think a lot of people don't believe about people like us. If you take it seriously, your most important job until your kids are out of the house is being a father or a mother someday. Wasn't well, it hard when you're, when you're president of the United States, you really have the time to be a parent as much as you might want? Is it kind of hard when you've got all these people coming at you or is that? It was hard. Our girls, one was at Yale, one was the University of Texas. And so they weren't handy as we say. And uh, uh, yeah, it's hard. But thankfully, Laura spent a lot of time nurturing them and uh, helping them out. The hardest thing, I knew what it's like to be a child of a president, and the criticism is harsh, regardless of who's president, and it stings well, if well, you're the child of somebody what? you love getting criticized, and so I was real worried about our girls reacting to the criticism that I got, and Laura was very good at comforting me, and I tried to do my best. What's it like when you have a daughter, and she goes out on a date, and the father is greeting the young man, and your president of the United States or your governor or president of the United States, what is that? It's kind of intimidating for the young man, I assume. Well, at the time, I certainly hoped so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Chelsea's boyfriends. You know, that, that, and she never went out with more than one boy at a time, but the, you know, the chapters got shorter and longer depending. But I remember she had one boyfriend in high school I really liked, but he wouldn't take his baseball cap off inside. So finally he sat down at dinner one night and I said, I really like you, you know that, don't you? He said, yes, sir, I do. I said, you can't wear that cap at dinner. I'm an old fashioned person, take the cap off. This guy goes on to become an architect and when, we, when you put your dad to me to work on Katrina, he was a young, person just started out, and I ran into him in Biloxi, working with three of his friends. They got leave from their job, and there they were, just three young people down there trying to help people put their lives back together. That's a, so I, you know, I, I treasured, you know, my daughter still brings somewhere between 18 and 25 or 26 people home for Thanksgiving every year, all their 
foreign friends who don't celebrate Thanksgiving or people who can't go home for Thanksgiving. And Hillary and I, we feed them and they go around the table and say what they're grateful for every year. And it, 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 if you, you cannot be pessimistic about the future if you hear young people say that. So well, that's it, the thing about tonight. Uh, I told people uh, earlier that came through uh, that you're not going to believe how uh, tonight's event will lift your spirits about the future of this country. And today, what, um, what makes you both most optimistic about this country today, the future of our country? What makes you most optimistic? Well, tonight, you'll see why I'm optimistic. We've got people of good heart, good skills, willing to serve others. And one of the most unique things about our country are the armies of compassion that exist throughout the United States that exist in spite of the government. These are people that say, I'm going to try to improve the community in which I live. And, uh, and tonight we're going to meet leaders uh, who do just that. And any nation with that kind of compassion is a nation that, uh, in which the citizenry ought to be optimistic. Now, when you became uh, former president, one of the things that you are now famous for doing is taking up painting. Correct. Um, people were a little surprised because you weren't thought to be an artist before. <laughs> um, so why did you take up you painting? You didn't think I was sensitive, David? I mean, uh, please. So how did you decide to paint, pick up painting, and why does it give you so much well, pleasure? One thing I hope people do is go down and look at the paintings in the exhibit after dinner tonight, uh, or it's right behind here. Uh, the reason I do it is because it heralds our vets. I painted because I was bored. I mean, uh, th this foundation and institute takes up time, but not enough. My exercise program wasn't taken enough. And so uh, I read Winston Churchill's essay, Painting is a Pastime, and I basically said, if that guy can paint, I can paint. Okay. All right. <laughs> President Clinton, uh, since you left the presidency, you've changed your your diet and other things. What have you spent the most time now that gives you the greatest pleasure now? Is it the Clinton Global Initiative or? Yeah, building my foundation and trying to fund it. You know, it's just a, it, it got so big so fast that it just took up all my time. But, and I'm, I'm trying to make it more entrepreneurial. That is, I'm trying to, something, once something gets really big and can fund itself, I'm trying to spin them all off now. But the, our health initiative now gives AIDS medicine over half the poor people in the world who got it. Thanks in no small measure to him passing PEPFAR, even though we never took any American money, it meant we could help drive the price of all medicine down everywhere. And uh, the Clinton Global Initiative, which we don't have anymore in its previous incarnation, but I'm working on some specific things. You know, we helped 400 million people with that. But it's, it takes a lot, it's a lot of trouble. You have to just keep at it all the time and at first I thought, oh, I don't want to do this, but I did. I, I, you know, I'm a workaholic, and I didn't think I could be a gifted painter. <laughs> but I admired him for doing that. And, you know, I think he would tell you that the best thing can happen to you when you're in politics is to be consistently underestimated. That's pretty good at that. You know, <laughs> and you made, well, wait, you made me... Right. He made me a genius because I look like a genius because when the presidential race in 2000 started in 1999, I turned on TV one night at the White House and I saw him sitting on a bale of hay in a tent in Iowa. And as far as I know, it was the first time he made that compassionate conservative speech. Wow. And I got on the phone and I said, you guys better pay attention to this. He could beat you. There's a big tension against giving any party three terms in a row in the White House. And what he said to people who could go either way is compassion conservative. I'll give you the same thing Clinton did, but I'll do it with a smaller government and a bigger tax cut. Wouldn't you like that? Right. <laughs> and I said, and as we know, starting with me, we Democrats are not as good as bumper, bumper stickers. And it was brilliant. And I thought, they're going to underestimate this guy. I also saw him beat Ann Richards, who's been a friend of mine for 20 years, and she had a 60% approval rating, and he won anyway because he understood that politics was about candidates, conditions, and culture, and not just what position you were taking on the issue. And he constructed a campaign that fit with where Texas was at that time. 
It didn't have anything to do. You didn't have to dislike Ann Richards to vote for George Bush. Appreciate so he maximized the number of people he could get. So how did the two of you come together to create the presidential uh, leadership uh, program, uh, presidential scholarship? Well, one of the real problems with these presidential uh, centers is that they become irrelevant pretty quickly unless there's something that, uh, th that uh, captures people's attention. And uh, Margaret Spellings, Ken's predecessor, said we ought to think about using uh, th uh, these platforms to uh, call young people together and encourage them through a leadership education program. And it made a lot of sense. And I, Bill and I talked together, and it, uh, it just it, it fit right into our, our, our view of uh, how to be useful. And, uh, uh, and that's how it got started. And then, of course, inviting dads and LBJs made a lot of sense. Uh, most people focus their attention on these libraries on the coast and stuff like that. He said, this is a valuable resource for people in, in, uh, in what we call the heartland. I also think, you know, one of the, you just talk to these young people here. They basically, you know, it's a nice thing to go to our libraries. We give speeches and everything. But I bet you anything that what the thing they get most out of is being with each other. And one of the things that's wrong with America today that bothers me more than anything else about our future is that we have separated ourselves and to like-minded communities. We may be less racist, homophobic, and sexist and other things, but we don't want to be around very many people who disagree with us normally. And we get news in silos. And the truth is, in an interdependent, complex world, diverse groups make better decisions than homogenous ones. And so these people would make better decisions. And everybody knows that, but they almost can't help themselves because when you get in national elections, it gets more abstracted and we all vote for the gridlock we say we hate. So I think this is great. I was telling George before we came out here, I just came from Lake Tahoe where we both, I started and he finished a plan to save Lake Tahoe. It's one of only two blue water lakes in the world and the Republicans and Democrats on the ground made it possible because they had the end in mind and all we did was say yes. Well, I just came from Columbia, where I started, but he mostly finished Plan Columbia, which gave the country back to its people. And it was a total bipartisan deal because we started with the end in mind. That, we got to get back to that in America. This is killing us, all this fighting over nothing, instead of saying, what the heck are we trying to get done? We have time for one more question. And I would, let's ask, finally, both of you could ask, answer this. Um, for those who are presidential scholars or other people watching, if somebody wants to be president of the United States, is the quality that is most important hard work, intelligence, optimism, luck? What do you think it takes for somebody who says, I want to be president, I want to be like you, I want to be like you? Humility. I think it's really important to know what you don't know and listen to people who do know what you don't know. I also think you have to begin with the end in mind. That is, you have to say, yeah, you got to win the election. But why in the heck are you running? That's the other thing I noticed about him. When he ran for governor against Ann Richards, he didn't say Ann Richards is a klutz. He said, I want to be governor because I want to do one, two, three things. A couple of them I didn't agree with, but he had an agenda. If you, if you want to be president, realize it's about the people, not about you. And when it's over, and... That's what a lot of these people who are real arrogant in office, they forget. Time passes, and it passes more, quicker than you, more quickly than you know. You want to be able to say, people were better off when I quit. Kids had a better future. Things were coming together. You don't, you, you don't want to say, God, I, look at all the people I beat or the people I worked over. I think the most important thing is to be humble, to listen, to realize everybody's got a story. All the things I learned as a kid. Listen, the only thing you disagree with in my platform was that Texas ought to take Arkansas. <laughs> now, what, I, uh, what I disagreed with is he wanted to get all of our water and not pay very much money for that's it. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> President... Uh, and I would have swapped it out for Texas oil. I told him, you know, <laughs> barrel for barrel. President Clinton, President Bush, I want to thank you for your service to our country and to thank you for the leadership you've given to so many people and thank you for what you're doing in your post-presidency. Thank you very much. Thank you all.
Good evening, everyone. I'm David Jones, and I represent the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library in, in College Station. And we are very proud partners in this uh, program, uh, Presidential Scholars Program. And I want to thank uh, President Bush, President Clinton, David Rubenstein, for really an extraordinary opportunity to, to, uh, to hear that conversation tonight. Could have gone on a little longer. <laughs> thank you. Well, I have the very high honor now of, of introducing our scholars. And we're going to ask them to come on the stage uh, individually. And when uh, they're introduced, I'll mention their professional affiliation and their residence. And we would ask that, uh, that you uh, hold your applause until all of the scholars have been introduced. It's a long list, so let's get started. First is Michael Addis who is litigation associate with Kravath, Swain, and Moore LLP in New York City. <laughs> Chike Agu is chief executive officer with Everyone On in Beltsville, Maryland. Gabriel Abernaz is director of Department of Recreation, Montgomery County, Maryland, from Kensington, Maryland. Lisa Atherton, President and Chief Executive Officer of Textron Systems, Keller, Texas. Vidya Ayer, Director of Social Impact, Parkland Health and Hospital System, Dallas, Texas. Hazami Barmada, Fellow with Harvard University, lives in Washington, D.C. Brian Barnes, co-founder and chief executive officer, Tandemed, Memphis, Tennessee. Anarema Bhargava, government fellow, Open Society Foundation, Chicago, Illinois. Dana Bolden, group director of Bottling Investments Group, the Coca-Cola Company, Atlanta, Georgia. Zachary Bongiovanni, Head of Global Partnerships, Emerging Markets for YouTube, San Francisco, California. Sheila Kalkleischer, Vice President of Global, Chief Privacy Officer and Public Policy Executive with Axion in Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> Marta Michelle Colon, Chief Attitude Strategist, Buena Gente, San Juan, Puerto Rico. <laughs> Rory Diamond, Chief Executive Officer, Canines for Warriors, Neptune Beach, Florida. Renee DeResta, Founder and Head of Marketing for Haven in San Francisco, California. David Dixon, Major, United States Marine Corps, Washington, D.C. <laughs> Thomas Dolan, Chief Operating Officer, CEI Capital Management, LLC, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Rudy Fernandez, Senior Vice President for Public Affairs and Chief of Staff to the President, University of Miami, Miami, Florida. J. 
Joshua Goldberg, Director of Strategy, Boulder Crest, Bluemont, Virginia. Carlos Gutierrez, Jr., Chief Executive Officer, Highline Point Group, LLC, New York City. Yasuman Hajibashi, Group Chief Creation Officer, Barclays Africa Group, Johannesburg, South Africa. Tracy Henry, Assistant Professor of Medicine and Assistant Health Director, Emory University, School of Medicine, Atlanta, Georgia. Jane Henserling, Founder and Head of School, the Mission Preparatory School, San Francisco, California. Wade Hinton, City Attorney and Chief Legal Officer, City of Chattanooga, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Gerardo Interreno, Head of External Affairs of Southwest United States for Google, Austin, Texas. Brad Israel, Chief Operating and Legal uh, Leadership Officer, 68 Ventures, Mobile, Alabama. Kristen Itu, Director of John H. Lucas Senior Wellness Center, Hillside High School, Durham, North Carolina. Kristen Judge, Director of Government Affairs, National Cyber Security Alliance, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Lenore Carafa, Managing Partner, McChrystal Group, Alexandria, Virginia. Hannibal Kemmer, Senior Attorney, Squire Patton Boggs, U.S. LLP, Reisterstown, Maryland. Basim Kwan, Executive Director, Neighborhood Health, Arlington, Virginia. Mansi Kotwal, Clinical Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, Children's National Medical Center, Washington, D.C. And C. Ram Khoi, Associate Chief of Staff, Michael DeBakey Veterans Affairs Medical Center, Houston, Texas. Lucy Lang, Special Counsel for Policy and Projects and Director of DANY Academy, New York County District Attorney's Office, New York. Francisco Martin Rayo, Organizational Transformation Expert, Boston Consulting Group, Washington, D.C. Katie McNerney, Founder and Partner, LeaderFit, Washington, D.C. Miriam Mimarsadega, co-founder and co-director, e-collaborative for civic education, Bethesda, Maryland. Hollis Menninger, producer, founder, and president, bridge builder, cinematic arts, Brooklyn, New York. Neha Mizra, co-founder and chief collaboration officer, Solar Sister, Washington, D.C. Michael Moore, Chief of Staff, North America's Building Trades Unions, Washington, D.C. <laughs> Griffin Myers, Co-Founder and Chief Medical Officer, Oak Street Health, Chicago, Illinois. Nataka Natyal, Executive Director of CASE, Chicago Anchors for a Strong Economy, World Business Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. Sarah Cotton Nelson, Chief Philanthropy Officer, Communities Foundation of Texas, Dallas, Texas. Scott Nolan, 
Director, Drug Addiction Treatment Program, Open Society Foundations, Baltimore, Maryland. Liz Northcutt, Founder and Chief Executive, City Living New York, Brooklyn, New York. Megan Ogilvy, Chief Executive Officer, Dog Tag Inc., Washington, D.C. Manny Palais, Councilman, City of San Antonio, Texas. Daniel Presley, Chief of Police, City of Webster, Texas, resides in League City, Texas. <clears throat> Natasha Kiroga, Prep Director and Senior Counsel for Education Opportunities Project, Lawyers Committee of Civil Rights Under Law, Washington, D.C. Michael Reeves, Managing Director, Greylock Capital Management, LLC, New Canaan, Connecticut. Christina Rosenthal, President and Chief Executive Officer, Paradigm Dental Center, LLC, Memphis, Tennessee. Byron Sanders, Vice President and Institutional Client Advisor, U.S. Trust, Dallas, Texas. Jennifer Sarver, Principal, Sarver Strategies, Austin, Texas. Scott Schlegel, District Court Judge, 24th Judicial District Court, Parish of Jefferson, State of Louisiana, Metairie, Louisiana. Jamie Scott, Executive Director of Pulaski County Youth Services, Pulaski County Government, North Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> Pruvjot Singh, Chair of Department of Health System Design and Global Health, Mount Sinai Health System, Pelham, New York. Shoaib Satafawala, Medical Director of South Asian Cardiovascular Center, Advocate Healthcare, Chicago, Illinois. Kate Smith, Director Emeritus of Strategic Planning and Development Committees, Raphael House, San Francisco, California. Joseph Stenger, Major, United States Air Force, Phoenix, Arizona. Brintha Vasagar, Physician and Associate Program Director, Tidelands Health, MUSC Family, Medicine Residency Program, Surfside, South Carolina. And Antonio Williams, Senior Director of Government and External Affairs, Comcast, NBC Universal, Washington, D.C. Let's give our scholars a huge hand. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, please welcome to the program our friend, distinguished chairman of the Lyndon B. Johnson uh, Presidential Library Foundation, Larry Temple. First of all, I want to thank President Clinton and President Bush on behalf of the LBJ Library and the LBJ Foundation. The Presidential Leadership Scholars Program was their brainchild and their implementation. Mr. President, I will say to you that we are in your debt for inviting us to participate in this absolutely stellar program. Well, tonight is a celebratory pause in a remarkable journey. None of you scholars 
were new to leadership when you came into this program. You were selected because you already were a leader in your own individual environment and your own individual way. The concept of the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program is to expose you to the historic actions and decision-making of past presidents to enhance your own skills and your own talents. You have done that. While this program is historic, the lessons of leadership are timeless. There are no attributes of leadership that apply to every person or every situation. At the Clinton Presidential Library, you examine the leadership principle of vision and communication. At the George W. Bush Presidential Center, you heard firsthand about the leadership principle of decision making. At the George H. W. Bush Presidential Library, you learned about the examples of the leadership principle of strategic partnerships. At the LBJ Library, you were exposed to leadership examples of the application of persuasion, albeit sometimes colorfully. <laughs> Those are some, but not all, of the facets of leadership. President Kennedy once said that leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. So you know you will always have to continue learning, both when you were at the, their presidential libraries and again tonight. Presidents Clinton and Bush articulated some of their precepts of leadership. Tonight, I thought I would add the leadership pronouncements of the other two presidents whose libraries you attended. President George H.W. Bush, Bush 41, once said, where is it written that we must act as if we do not care, as if we are not moved? Well, I am moved. I want a kinder and gentler nation. President Bush's entire career both embodied and epitomized the leadership concepts of caring and compassion. LBJ once said, if the leadership of our country supports us over the long, hard pull that lies ahead, if you can endure the tensions, if you can understand the air is going to be rough and the road is going to be bumpy, you can, in the words of the creed, help us unlock Earth's great treasure, human personality. Then the cussers and doubters, he said, will be relegated to the rear, the doers and the builders, will take up the front lines. Well, you are the doers and the builders of this generation. One of the goals of the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program is to educate you about the lessons and styles of past presidents so that you can shape the future of our nation in your own ways. That future is now yours to develop. That is why I said at the outset that tonight only represents a pause in your journey. When President Franklin Roosevelt died, Walter Lippmann, the preeminent journalist of his time noted, the final test of a leader is that he leaves behind him in others the conviction and the will to carry on. The genius of a good leader is to leave behind him a situation which common sense without the grace of genius can deal with successfully. In this program, you have witnessed women and men who are some of the successful legacies of our four presidents. You are now the legacies of three great presidents and four presidential libraries. Now the question is, will you carry on what they started? Did they make a good investment in the time, information, and teaching they provided to you? Each of you will have to make your own answer to that question. We will wait, watch, and see. Congratulations on your graduation tonight. And now I have the pleasure of saying we'll adjourn to dinner upstairs. Thank you. <laughs>